<laughs> and we are live on the Gamification Revolution. Hello, everybody. So good to see you. I'm your host, Gabe Zickerman, and I'm coming to you today from a beautiful fall evening, now evening, in Dublin, Ireland. I'm so glad to have you with us. And I'm joined today by Scott Rinke from Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Hello, Scott. Hello. Woohoo. All right, you guys. For those of you who are joining us live, so nice to see you. Nice to see so many of you back uh, this week again. And for those of you who are listening to us on the podcast or via the video replay soon on Freecast, nice of you to join us. Be sure to join us every other Thursday at 1 o'clock Eastern time if you want to be on the show live. And if you are here with us live and you have questions for me or for Scott, you'll need to log in with one of your social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. And then you can actually ask us questions. You can chat here live with us. You can post questions in the chat. We'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. And frankly, I don't know that it'll work out, but if you look good and uh, you are partially clothed, you can even come on video and ask us questions live on video right here on the Gamification Revolution. So glad to have you with us. Okay, so Scott, um, I know that the program uh, that you've been working on at Ball State uh, has been under wraps for a while. So it's just like now kind of coming out into the public eye. Can you tell us a little bit about Ball State Achievement? Yeah, so uh, Ball State Achievements is a retention program uh, that runs off of a mobile application for iOS and Android. Uh, and the program uh, rewards students for uh, engaging with the university and doing different activities that help them succeed as students. Uh, some examples of some of those things are like going to the Career Center, attending even attending events like uh, football games or athletics. Um, attending student life programs like BSU Late Night and Friday Night Filmworks, um, and even more simple things like just visiting uh, different landmarks at Ball State University and kind of checking in and learning your way around the campus and visiting different dining halls, that sort of thing. And then students, when they complete those achievements, uh, earn bennies and experience, and through those bennies, our spendable currency, uh, they can purchase real items from the Ball State Bookstore, as well as our tech store, and also different activities such as outdoor pursuits and things of that nature. So when you say retention, can you be more specific and can you tell us something about um, you know, how the program has been doing so far? Yeah, so retention is, uh, what we found was that there are groups of students that are most at risk for not being retained from their freshman to sophomore year, meaning that they don't return to the university, that they, uh, drop out or just don't return for whatever reason um, and that and or retain all the way through graduation of course is the goal of four-year graduation um, and we have seen uh, we have some of our preliminary results of course something like retention um, you know you kind of have to look at that years at a time uh, and so we just completed our first year of Ball State achievements and we're in our first semester of our second year um, and the preliminary findings show that uh, app users did have a higher retention rate. Um, they also had higher GPAs, more credit hours earned, and were more engaged in the university. Um, did you do that as a controlled study, or um, was it just kind of opt-in for everybody? Like, do you have a do you have a control group against which you're comparing the results? Yeah, it, it, we we did have a control. Um, so we had our our research group. And we also, uh, so after the first semester, we also allowed in uh, any freshman or sophomore after we had invited our research group. So we did have users of, of both in and outside of our research group to look at. And we actually did find that even uh, students outside of our research group uh, had better, more success here at the university. Oh, that's really great. I love that you guys had a bit of a control group there so that you could mm -hmm. compare them. Um, what, so it's a really, really interesting idea. Um, now I know, are you focused specifically on students that are at risk as a general rule here, or is it uh, kind of the whole student population that you're trying to focus on with the retention? Well, right now we are just focused on at-risk students. Um, that was kind of the, that was the, the, the charge in the beginning was to find a way using technology to uh, increase graduation and retention in at-risk students. Um, however, uh, you know, I am fairly confident, and I think we're pretty confident in the program that it could be beneficial to all students um, down the line. 
What can you so explain a little bit of the design idea? Like I love the way that you design this because it's exactly sort of the way that I um, you know that I like to think about this this problem. But can you just walk us through a little bit of like the the kind of genesis and the design concept that brings you to an app, uh, you know, as the way that you've designed it here? Sure. Well, I guess first of all, the the decision is why choose an app, um, and that's really fairly simple. Uh, is that students have phones. <laughs> that's kind of how most students like to communicate, and so we wanted to put something in their hands to kind of guide them through that process. Um, you know, if you think traditionally, a lot of the different uh, uh, resources at a university kind of uh, market for themselves, send individual emails, you know, that sort of thing, and this kind of curates and put all the, puts all those things in one spot for the student, as well as gives them an idea through the currency system and the point system of kind of what's important, uh, you know, what, what we view as kind of pushing them more towards success. Um, so, I mean, really the idea was to, um, to take all of those resources and just show them to the student. I mean, that's our core concept is to have all of those things available and have them be rewarded for engaging and finding those things. Um, so, you know, we have achievements in there that are just visit your career coach, um, sure. register for classes, you know, visit your academic advisor, that sort of thing. Why didn't you just like incentivize them to stay? Like, why not just give them a bunch of cash to like stay in the school? Um, well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that would really be effective just because they're already incentivized to stay. Really, I mean, they they're here for a reason to get an education. Um, so, I, I don't, and one aspect actually, and I'll kind of a question that I get quite often that I'll kind of paraphrase into what you said was a lot of people ask me about why uh, don't we do gift cards and why don't we do uh, direct cash or percentage off tuition or book vouchers um, and the reason for that is that um, so we, we really only have items that are like from the Ball State bookstore items that people can pick up like shirts or teddy bears or you know outdoor pursuits activities and the reason for that is that that creates an item that that person has that they keep that can become a keepsake, like they'll, they'll always remember, oh, I got this teddy bear from Ball State Achievements and concurrently through my involvement with Ball State University. And so that kind of endears them to the university and, and becomes more of a special thing. I mean, if you just think about, uh, try to remember any gift card or cash that you might have received in a card you know, for your birthday, and you probably don't remember very many details about it, but you definitely remember special items that you got. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's very insightful, but also like I'm, I'm kind of curious about the insight about trying to incentivize them to take these different actions, like seeing a counselor, like checking out the university and all that. Is the What's the underlying logic behind focusing on these particular actions? Is the idea that if they just did more stuff at the school um, that they would want to stay more? Yeah, well, a part of it is that most at-risk youth or most at-risk students, uh, you know, typically they don't have uh, parents that achieved high levels of success in collegiate life. And what that ends up doing is, you know, when you don't necessarily have people in your life that have gone through the process before that you can directly talk to, you know, mentors that have walked you through that process, you don't necessarily know that the career center is a thing at a university. You don't necessarily know that it's important to register for classes early or to do those sorts of things. And so we're trying to offer that as a resource to try to, you know, show them all those things that are available and incentivize them to, at the very least, explore the possibilities of using those things. And was there any, is there any actual like research or science behind that connection? Like, was there some evidence that said that if they did more of these things around the campus, they might stay longer or was it, is that a hypothesis that you're testing at the same time as you're testing the kind of does gamification work? Yeah, I, I have definitely been uh, informed by my colleagues that there is research out there <laughs> that uh, that backs that up. I can't really cite any off the top of my head, um, but yeah, it's it's definitely something that has been uh, backed up in research that engagement does increase the chance of retention. So what's been the most surprising finding to you? I mean, I, I'm sure that you were, um, you know, now that you've got a controlled study and you can show improvement in retention, you're very confident that it worked. 
Um, but what was what's the thing that you've been most um, kind of surprised about in terms of how people have responded to it or what they've done in response to it? Um, it was really surprising when we started last semester. Um, I didn't really expect as much uptake as we had. Um, and I don't necessarily mean in terms of an explosion of population, but more that a lot of the students that we had that had adopted the program, that downloaded the app, would just, uh, we, we, okay, I'll, I'll use an example. We had one student that we could see on our interface, kind of like reading the matrix, you know, you can see the activity of students um, that would literally get those exploration achievements within like a 30 second time period, which would indicate that he was literally running from landmark to landmark <laughs> and, uh, and engaging, you know, uh, and, and checking in on those. And so we had a lot of students that kind of like ran the gauntlet through our app and like, you know, did all the things that we had. And so we found ourselves, you know, we thought we had more content than we, when we even needed. And so we found ourselves needing to generate new content and that led to creating repeatable achievements uh, in the form of things like working out at the rec center um, and things like that. So, and I was um, also very, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I was also very surprised that um, the spending habits of a lot of students and, and really even the saving habits of a lot of students with the Binnies. Um, because we, uh, one of our, right now, our second most purchased item are uh, women's sweatpants <laughs> out, of, out of a lot of different things we have in the store. Uh, number one was a Camelback Eddie water bottle. So, and we saw a lot of students were kind of saving their Binnies up and waiting for um, higher ticket items to be on the store. And, and I assume that these things have like the logo on it, right? So there must be some good self-reinforcing cycle of like, I'm achieving this thing, look at me going to university, look at me staying in school, um, you know, and then being able to express that to other people. Do you have, do you have any information about how uh, that or any insight from your own experience about how that kind of those demonstrable, we'll call them like status items, but you know, not like a kind of gamified status items necessarily, how they play into that equation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't really have any hard research to back it up, but I suppose my kind of insight and opinion on it is just that, you know, a lot of students want to have those sorts of things uh, that kind of endear them to the university and, uh, you know, some of the, the Ball State football jerseys and all those branded things. And sometimes it's more difficult because a, a lot of things like that that are branded end up kind of being a little more expensive and possibly outside the price range of some high, more at-risk students. So it's definitely cool to be able to offer opportunities for them to get some of those things that maybe they wouldn't have been able to justify the purchase in the past. I, I, that's what I remember from undergrad also. Like, you know, my, my family didn't have a lot of money, and it was difficult for me to, you know, from a financial standpoint, university was, um, even though I went to school in Canada, uh, you know, it was nonetheless, um, you know, expensive for me. I, I couldn't really afford to buy a ton of that collegiate wear, but it was sort of a status thing to have. You know, those really nice sweatshirts was always the thing that I, uh, you know, that I yeah. think about. And they, they were they were a fortune. Those sweatshirts are mm -hmm. like so expensive if you don't have money. Have, have you guys given any thought to um, maybe doing some stuff that's like just for the program? So like maybe some custom gear or whatever that, that you can only get if you're trading in those bennies from, uh, from Ball State Achievement? Yeah, we absolutely want to do that. Um, it's just kind of, well, so uh, an issue is uh, storage, really, uh, and a lot of, with rarely within a university, but I know here at Ball State, like, there's an issue of who would control that product, uh, since it is, it's kind of complicated since right now we're operating in uh, coordination with a grant as well as with the university. So the financial aspect of, of, that exchange is a lot easier and less complicated through the bookstore. But yeah, absolutely. We do want to get some, you know, achievements, t-shirts and, and swag and all kinds of stuff like that. Can you, since you just brought up uh, the funding source for this, can you tell us a little bit about the journey of getting a program like this approved and what some of the, uh, you know, maybe challenges that you face? Think about it for other people who create gamified solutions. Because to me, it feels like, um, uh, you know, universities would be such a natural place for this, but you yourself are such a big advocate for gamification, um, you know, and this is a very unique approach to this problem. Can you talk a little bit about what you went through to get it approved and get it done? Sure. So 
Well, it, it didn't start with me, I guess, first of all. <laughs> um, it started with uh, uh, the Vice President of uh, Student Affairs, uh, Dr. Kay Bales. Uh, she's my boss. Um, and they went through an Educause initiative uh, that basically, like I said, asked for something in technology that would help at-risk students. And so we went through that process of creating a pilot a few years ago, and that was actually when I got involved with the project uh, through, I was doing usability testing on the initial pilot. Um, and then while I did that in my report, I also added in a lot of stuff with gamification that I thought would benefit the program, and that eventually led to me being in this position, basically. Um, so in terms of what it takes kind of financially or logistically to make the program work, um, we were awarded that grant, um, but it was also in coordination with the three-year agreement from the university to kind of also provide funding. And it was a board level uh, initiative, so it wasn't just student affairs, it was, all, it was you know, the whole board um, that kind of agreed to take this on at a university. Um, and, you know, obviously that's a lot more co coordination and can be a lot more difficult um, to do, but it was, you know, obviously because it involved business affairs as well as uh, IT, you know, a lot of different places kind of resources had to come from a lot of different places to kind of make it happen. Um, How long so did you take you to go from the idea to the current project? Um, I'm trying to think back in time. I mean, we've been developing fairly iteratively. I would say, I mean, I would say it took about a year um, to go from kind of, okay, we have this solid idea that we want to create, and then to actually having an app and kind of being ready to launch. And then, you know, we, we've had our last year to, to run our kind of beta, I suppose you could call it. What was the gamification elements, were the gamification elements, um, uh, difficult to uh, like get people to get behind and and what was it before it became this because you made it sound like they've been working on this three year program and and got grant funding to do it. Well, it was one no, it wasn't difficult to get people on board with gamification. I think people were pretty excited about the idea um, right off the bat from from my understanding. Um, it, it wasn't completely different, but it was much more of a of just a general badges kind of concept, um, and then I tried to add sort of, we tried to add a lot of the different aspects of just, you know, different forms of currency, um, changing some of the actual, like, graphic design around, um, changing the way that uh, achievements were offered and how people could get them, uh, creating some paths that were, uh, we call them combo achievements, but, you know, like, it's doing more than one achievement, one lock another achievement and some sort of sequencing like that. Um, so, I mean, really just some of the some of the basics of, you know, engagement and, uh, and design. So do you, if you had to, like, look forward, um, and I know that, you know, now is probably a, a very optimistic moment, but if you project forward, um, do you see more of this being uh, taken up in university population in general? And, and what would you like to do next with what you've done so far? How would you like to iterate this and make it bigger or more successful? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely scalable. And especially uh, something that makes it scalable is there's so much interest right now in, uh, I don't know what the term would be for it, but uh, I, guess, I guess content management system of sorts, like event management systems, you know, are really huge with universities right now. And I think with those, that, that's part of what makes uh, achievements possible is that we can connect our API to, you know, our event management system. So that way, things that are already verified at the university, we can we can award achievements based on that. Um, oh, so you want to connect in terms it to of, more, you mean you want to connect it to more different kinds of things that people might do, like attend class? Is that what you mean? I mean, that would be fantastic to be able to do that sort of thing. Uh, but that's, that's much more difficult because there aren't really mechanisms in place that, that verify those things automatically or, you know, that have, you know, high degrees of scrutiny with their verification. It, that, that would have to be a self-reported, you know, type achievement. Did you guys consider any of those things, like going to class, meeting with an advisor, mm -hmm. uh, doing stuff like that? Yeah, so things like meeting with an advisor we can definitely track because those are tracked through systems. 
Um, but we did talk about when we when I met with uh, I've met with retention specialists several times um, to see you know kind of stuff that they have students do. And a couple of examples. Uh, one is uh, having students sit in the front of the classroom. So we thought for a long time about how we would actually have an achievement for sitting in the front of the classroom. And unfortunately, technically, we haven't been able to figure out how to do that yet. <laughs> Uh, aside from maybe having like Bluetooth, you know, receivers like everywhere in the university. Um, and then we also, something they mentioned was filling out an agenda helps a student and we were trying to figure out a way to verify that. Yeah, what, one idea about sitting in the front of the class that could kind of work is you could uh, put down a unique QR code um, on two of the seats in the front of the class and the first two people to check in uh, to those seats, right, they just, they get that thing. And you can only, you have to be one of those two, first two people to scan them and that's all there is. Um, yeah. Right? Or there, there could be like a little, um, you know, display at the front that, you know, just every day, you know, or every class comes up with two different codes. Um, there's lots of ideas. We can brainstorm. Okay. Question from, a uh, question from Ken um, huh? in the chat, which was using it on potential students. So people who are not yet attending, but prospective students for the school. Um, can you talk about that a little bit or any ideas that have come up for that? Yeah, absolutely. We've actually, a discussion we've had um, quite often is is actually not only that, but kind of the cradle to grave idea, which would be, um, you know, we could do something for even like high school students in terms of helping them gear up to get into college and, you know, specifically, hopefully, Ball State University. Um, so kind of offer a path uh, to do that. And then also offering um, to alumni, uh, because I think the whole achievements program would be something that a lot of alumni would jump on pretty quickly, um, you know, just to, because we do have a leaderboard as well, <laughs> and, uh, you know, alumni can be very competitive with their involvement. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, can you, um, so the alumni side also seems like it would be a good source of ongoing funding uh, when your mm -hmm. grant funding sort of runs out uh, for the uh, you know, at-risk students if you can't kind of make that business case. Um, have you been giving some thought to how you might fund this going forward? I don't know what the environment is like at Ball State, but, um, you know, how do you keep this as an ongoing concern? So really where the ROI is on achievements in general is, you know, it, it sounds like it's a whole lot of money going out and nothing coming back in. Uh, but we, we obviously have a vested interest in actually you know, graduating students in four years, helping students succeed in four years. Um, there are actually incentives by the state of Indiana uh, to do so, and specifically with at-risk students. So, you know, in a way, if the if if we do increase retention and graduation, then that comes out to actual funding, kind of in and of itself. So, right. So basically, it's coming out of kind of the like not marketing budget, but in a way, kind of the the operating budget of the university, right, to, to retain those students. Sure, yeah. It's a student program, so. What's different about, and what might you do differently if you were going to extend this to the entire student body? Like, what's the, what's the first thing that needs to change if it goes from at risk to the gen pop? Um, I don't know. Honestly, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm pretty comfortable with where it is now with the general population, I would say. Uh, so the are there, yeah, yeah, no. So are there plans to, like, roll that out to everybody in the next semester or next year? or Not in the next semester. I, I would say that probably within our three-year agreement, because the whole idea is that within the three years, we're going to see what happens with retention, how successful the program is, and at that point is when we have to start having conversations of, do we want to make this a permanent thing at Ball State? Um, you know, is this sustainable? Um, you know, and that kind of thing. And uh, that's really when the the uh, conversations would start happening for releasing it to the entire population. How do you how do you actually market something like this to the student body? Like, what's the method for uh, uh, for getting this to actually you know for people to actually know about it and want to install the app? Sure. So that was actually uh, a pretty major difficulty for us for last year um, because we – so the, the way that the app works is you actually log in with your Ball State username and address – or username and password. So it's authenticated through actual Ball State systems. And because of that, we had to 
you know, create gates on our end that would look to see if those students met our research requirements. And so that meant that we didn't have, you know, it didn't make a lot of sense to um, advertise, you know, have flyers up or do any kind of mass marketing to that effect um, that usually can help spread the word. So we basically had to use just direct, you know, direct emails. We sent out phone blasts, um, even physical mailers um, to dorms and, and the such. Um, so, yeah. That seems like um, that seems like one of those challenges that definitely would be, you know, like, um, are there any kind of uh, viral elements to the app? So to get students to uh, uh, engage each other, are there things that they can do? And have you thought about any of those kind of like real life, like LARP type experiences for the app uh, for people to actually do on, on campus together? Yes, uh, we did do uh, actually a low tech uh, viral <laughs> solution was a, uh, in uh, the start of spring semester, we actually used the uh, golden ticket concept. Uh, we sent out mailers with three uh, literal golden printed tickets uh, to our current users from fall semester and basically told them that this is your golden ticket to invite any friend you want to the program. Uh, so that way we let them kind of invite their friends to participate. And we did that because um, we implemented a concept called uh, where we would let students do events and things that were uh, um, uh, location and time based, like check in based achievements. We allowed students to do those with other people to where they would, I think the way, the way we had it was if they did it with another person, claim it with a friend, they would get 150% uh, extra bennies and uh, experience. If they did it with like two friends, it was 160 on up to 200% with five people. So that way we were encouraging those students to um, you know, do things with their friends. And that actually comes directly from the research. Uh, some of the research that we found said that uh, one of the number one uh, factors that students reported in uh, retention was having a peer that was a pos positive influence in their life. So we definitely wanted to, you know, have that engagement with other people. So Michelle asked in the chat about um, extending the uh, application to kind of uh, more, like more non-traditional students. And so I think it's we well understand that the first target were these at-risk students, which are one of the groups. Mm -hmm. What about other groups inside the school that maybe um, are like even somewhat, you know, kind of further afield, just to take Michelle's question to another level? like distance learning students or, um, you know, or older students or graduate students, for example? Sure. Um, with online students, I would say we haven't really designed much in that respect for the app yet. Um, it's definitely something we've talked about and that we'd like to figure out. Um, it's just kind of different, especially considering that m so much of the app is focused on physically getting people places that they need to be for success. Um, for non-traditional students, I would have to really think about and research the nuances of what affects them. But I, I would say that a lot of those problems are probably similar in terms of, you know, when I come from, uh, you know, if I'm an at-risk student um, and I come from a background where I don't really feel like I belong at the university, that's probably a similar feeling to a non-traditional student that's coming back to school after maybe 20 years or something like that. You know, maybe they don't, maybe college has changed since they've been there and they don't really know their way around. So I think a lot of the uh, mechanisms that we already have in place would actually work very well with non-traditional students as well. Um, so let me ask you one final question before, because we're, we're about to run out of time. Always goes so fast. Uh, so yeah, if oh, you yeah. were just going to, yeah, if you were just going to sort of project forward from your position as a kind of gamification designer who's, you know, uh, kind of spearheaded the, the design of this idea and the advocacy for it. If you could wave your uh, magic wand at the kind of university experience with what you've known and what you've learned from Ball State Achievement, um, what would you change uh, to make the university experience more engaging? What would be your, um, you know, your first kind of, uh, beyond Ball State Achievement, what would you do next to sort of gamify university? Um, so, Something that I would absolutely love to see is a um, gamified and very well designed, um, uh, uh, I don't, I don't, what's the term? We call it a dapper here, or we used to call it a dapper. Um, that's like the, uh, the way you see your courses and what you need to complete. 
Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, like I think that alone, like just creating a very crisp, clear interface for that that you can actually play with and kind of move around and add logic in there to create different paths for yourself, I think that would make, because I think the hardest thing about being a freshman and coming to university is how do you visualize something that, you know, by virtue you don't understand yet? <laughs> you know, like how do you visualize a four-year graduation path when you're just learning about the university? Yeah. And there's just so many choices. It's hard to it's hard to get all of that, get your head around that. I love that systems of progress and mastery so important. Um, and so uh, Scott, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I want to remind everybody that you can join the uh, author group for Gamification by Design Two, um, and uh, actually make contributions to the latest version of the book and uh, be listed as a co-author on it. It's GamificationByDesign.com. And uh, for those of you that are interested in in keeping abreast of all the latest things that are happening at Ball State and the gamification of, uh, you know, keeping students in school. Uh, you can follow Scott Linke at uh, S-C-O-T-T-R-E-I-N-K-E -E on Twitter. Scott, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. And everybody else, thank you so much for joining us, those of you who are live. Uh, great to see you, those of you who are uh, on the podcast. We'll see you hopefully soon. And just so that uh, for those of you who are live and listening and want to know, on the 8th of October, we've got a very exciting upcoming um, Gamification Revolution webinar with Amy Jo Kim. Uh, Amy Jo, for those of you who don't know, is a great uh, designer of experiences. She has a new uh, workshop series that promises to be very exciting. She's going to be talking about it with us uh, just in about one week's time. So until then, everybody, thank you so much. I'm your host, Gabe Zuckerman. In the meantime, keep having fun. See you soon.